warm welcome to this seminar climate justice and south africa so my name is sofia svarvar and i work with south africa for act church of sweden we have two super interesting women women here today francesca De Gasparis, director of SAFSE, a Southern Africa Faith Communities Environmental Institute, uh, working interreligious with climate justice, climate change, environment issues. And Marika Grisel, a very well known Swedish journalist, storyteller. Um, Yesterday, we, you screened your documentary, uh, Remembering Desmond Tutu. Hmm. South Africa is one of the most unequal country in the world. At the same time, the 30th largest emitter of um, fossil fuels globally. We see increased poverty, increased hunger. So this dilemma, being a big emitter as a country, and at the same time facing so many different challenges. Francesca, if you start to give us your picture of the situation in South Africa, is climate change at all on the agenda. Thank you, Sophia. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here and hello to everyone, all our friends, and thank you for the opportunity to be here in Sweden at the book fair. It's very exciting for me. I haven't been uh, to such a wonderful gathering before, uh, and it's great, the bits that I can understand in English. I've really enjoyed uh, being here. Um, yes, South Africa, it's, it's a great honor to represent South Africa. Um, as you say, the organization I work for, the Southern African Faith Communities Environment Institute, also known as SAFSI. Um, we have been working on environmental and climate justice issues for the past 17 odd years. And we were brought together um, as people of faith who were very concerned about the state of the environment and the connection between people of faith and uh, what we are doing to the earth, um, our sacred earth. And so it was always a multi-faith approach, meaning all faiths and none came together and formed the organization. And um, we then embarked on this work with people of faith in Southern Africa, in the region and East Africa. Um, but we're based in South Africa, that's where we started and that's what, what I'm going to speak about today. Um, South Africa is, as you say, such a complex country with such a difficult legacy of apartheid and colonialism. And that's always going to be the starting point of any conversation that we have about what's happening in the country that I live in, because it's, the inequality goes further than perhaps what you might see in uh, parts of Europe or elsewhere. So really understanding that context and not just the economic uh, hardship of it, but also the trauma that comes with that, how it fractured society, the social inequalities as well. And when you see the impacts of the climate crisis, it's happening to those who are least able to respond to the climate crisis are of course those who are most impacted. And we've seen this in many ways already in South Africa, unfortunately. Climate change is with us. Um, we can see that from the temperatures you've been experiencing in Sweden, maybe not this year, but definitely last year. I think the UK registered its highest temperature ever this year at 40 degrees. So we really know that it's happening. Um, of course, scientists always want to look back and say, yes, that was climate change that you had last year or five years ago. We don't need to work in that kind of way. I think we know what we're experiencing and we know what we're seeing. So extreme weather events are exp being experienced in South Africa. We had the floods this last year in KwaZulu-Natal. They called it a rain bomb. It had so much impact that it killed about 400 people. 
people lost their homes, and these are the people who are living in the floodplains. These are the people who are already diaspora, um, people from other countries who are climate migration, uh, climate migrants, people who don't have money, who are having to live in unstable structures in unsafe places. They're the people who are being hit the most hardest. So it absolutely is a reality for us, and we are ill prepared for it. Um, the situation, if you just drive around South Africa, in, I live in Cape Town, if you drive along the coast, uh, on the coastal road going towards um, the beautiful mountains um, where some of our biggest hydro dams are, you will see people living right in these furrows. And as soon as you have a lot of rain, those people will be washed away, literally. Their homes, their families, their animals. It's, it's a very dire state in South Africa. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the, the broader picture, the big picture of, of the reality today. Uh, Marika, you've been following uh, the country, the history. Uh, what's your analysis of the situation today? And I also know that you do have some stories. You are a storyteller. <laughs> well, thank you very much. Uh, no, I mean, um, I think the awareness of uh, climate change and environmental issues have grown uh, in South Africa and at the continent at large over the last 15 years. Uh, and I think that um, South Africa particularly have a, a good position with many good journalists who are looking into these issues, which is then once again raising the awareness and also being able to put pressure on uh, politicians and, and, and industry. Uh, but I mean, it's obvious over the last, even when I lived in South Africa, we had those uh, rainfalls that were, you know, in two days you had as much as you could get maybe in three months, which caused enormous havoc. And that in combination with a uh, infrastructure and a population growth, uh, which you just explained, is, is a disaster. So many people have lost their lives. And I think, you know, first you don't understand why is this happening, and now the awareness of gro is growing. But also journalists who, um, I will just say that because there are some amazing uh, good reports in some of, of the internet newspapers like uh, uh, the Mail and Guardian or the Daily Maverick, if one is interested to follow good reporting of the climate change and the environmental impact. But also, when that is happening, when the awareness is growing in the communities, people are rising up and saying, we don't want this. We are challenging the mining industry or the authorities. And of course, that has also created a situation where climate activists have been targeted. Um, so it's actually dangerous to be a climate activist also in South Africa, and I can give some examples later, but we see that in other countries in the world as well, I mean, in South America uh, particularly. Um, so, um, and, and that has to do, of course, that because it is such an enormous interest in continuing to mine coal, uh, other minerals, not just in, in, in um, South Africa. Uh, and also, you know, African leaders and not also South African leaders are not uh, interested in being in the forefront <laughs> of working for a, a better climate. Thank you. And Francesca, you as SAFSE, you meet faith leaders at different level in society. Um, listen to Marika, the challenges, the, the safety of activists, but what's, what's your methods and strategies to, to bring faith leaders and communities together? Thank you so much. I mean, the wonderful thing about uh, South Africa and Southern Africa is that really, you know, for the over 70%, even 90% of people really identify with having a faith so it's something that's very commonly held. Um, we don't always understand each other. We're a very diverse part of the world. Lots of, I think South Africa has 11 official languages, so you can imagine we really are a very diverse bunch of people. In fact, as you see me sitting here, I am a South African citizen, but 
You will probably know if you know South Africa. I don't really have a South African accent, and that's a whole other topic, which I can bore you with after this in person. Um, but uh, the faith community in South Africa are, of course, uh, of the churches. Um, there are many people who are very devout church followers, also Muslim, the Jewish community, and then the indigenous uh, faiths, traditional leaders, and so on. So you have a wonderful, diverse group of people that we work with. And um, so a faith leader is something that we de define quite loosely, in fact. Um, because sometimes, for us, it's very important to see a representation of women and men. And so uh, often still the, the formal uh, structures can be more uh, patriarchal. So for us, a faith leader is anyone who is an active person in their faith, who is active in their community and takes a leadership role. And we, want, we love the diversity of the faiths because they indeed give us access to every single uh, space in society uh, in a way that is respectful, that is representative, and that allows us to understand the lived experience of those communities because it is so diverse. So I think for us as SAFSI, that's something that's very important to be inclusive and also to listen to people's experiences and to learn from each other. I think maybe I painted quite a dire um, picture in my first contribution. But I also want to say that those who are most impacted by environmental degradation and by association climate change are also those who have the greatest capacity to be real leaders and be the agents of change. And we, that's central to our work at SAFSI, that both those, and I think you see this sometimes in South America as well, that those who may be most disenfranchised are also those who will bring about the real change that we want to see. So I think that's the thing, is to not let people feel that disempowerment means that you are disempowered. Uh, that is actually the point of, of action that needs to take place in society. So how do we move from being disempowered by circumstance, by um, lack of resource, to actually being empowered to be part of the conversation around uh, the climate justice? And what does that look like? So that's something that I'll go into a little bit more in a bit. Thank you. Thank, thank you. But just to follow up, can the, the church there be... be a safe space or a space where you can come together? Yeah, I think, I think churches in, in South Africa, like everywhere, can be a safe space and they can be, there can be a real sense of we are looking after those most vulnerable. We know churches in South Africa have a long history of standing up to power and were safer spaces. Of course, not always, like everywhere, Sometimes they also reflect the parts of society that we need to make changes in. But generally speaking, that is, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. So we, people in South Africa are living in this dilemma, being a big emitter, a global economy, and at the same time, people living in poverty. We are waiting for some stories, so I give it to you too. What, well, what I have mean, you heard? Uh, uh, quite a few seen? here I can see are quite knowledgeable and have been to South Africa uh, knowing that, we, that it's, it's a microcosm. You know, anything that is possible in the world could happen in South Africa. We've seen it, you know, there are miracles. Uh, but all the challenges you can also see, it's like holding up a mirror of the world when you look at South Africa for me. And I'm not the only one who's saying that. I mean, a famous journalist, Alistair Sparks, mentioned this in his, his books. Um, so, you know, that is the, the beauty of South Africa, but it's also the challenge. And somehow it's, if you look at it, you, you, uh, you know, if, if things can be solved there, we can so, draw so much learning from that and use it other places as well. But examples are where people are made aware of the connection of their living conditions and the extraction of minerals or coal. You know, um, the demand for electricity has grown in South Africa and it's a coal-based electricity system in itself that's unsustainable. A lot of coal is being exported. 
there are highways going to Richards Bay, which is one of the big ports, or Durban for that matter, 24-7 with coal transport out to mainland China and other uh, uh, countries that import uh, South African coal. And in an area called Umfulosi uh, County in KwaZulu-Natal, there was a group of families, women, who got together and, and created an environmental uh, group where they, challenging, they were challenging the local coal mine because they wanted to extract more coal in an open shaft. It's mainly open shaft coal mining in South Africa. And two years ago, this 65-year-old woman was gunned down outside her house because she had challenged the powers. And, of course, nobody has been uh, taken to court or hold responsibility. So that kind of um, straffrihet, which I'm now forgetting the English word of... <laughs> Impunity. Impunity, thank you very much. Uh, you see... And there are other examples as well. And of course, that scares people. Uh, there are other examples uh, in uh, Transkai, for example, where they have wanted to extract from the sand dunes and the local communal minerals, and the, the local community have said no. Uh, but at the same time, the whole of South Africa's economy, or big part of it, is based on extracting minerals and coals. Um, so it's, uh, they, they hold in a kind of uh, very, very s bad situation. But I, I want to highlight again the role of, of media because uh, the amount of reporting on these issues have risen uh, tenfold over the last few years. And that creates awareness and that creates action. So that's very important that that kind of journalism is uh, supported. Thank you. Do you agree? Can you also see it's stronger in, in media, the climate change issues? And also, are you afraid? How do you work uh, as a climate and environmental activist? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'd say that's one of the places where South Africa, as many of you will know, is a leader. Their journalism is exceptional. Um, as you mentioned, the Daily Maverick has our Burning Planet series, and it's absolutely brilliant. And it's very accessible to civil society, of which SAFSI is a member. And um, so you really hear diverse voices coming out there and sharing uh, what is happening as you're hearing. It, it is risky to be a, an environmental defender, an envir a climate activist in South Africa. I have to say that as SAFSI, I don't know if it's because of our religious alignment, but generally speaking, we haven't had the same... Um, challenges that some people have. But I think also, unfortunately, some of this comes down to things like which community you live in. If you are in a, a, a community, a poorer community, or in an informal settlement, um, you can, it can be much more risky for you uh, to be an activist. Um, you're, you're more vulnerable and you can be more exposed. But I can say when, when Saf SAFSI and Earth Life Africa took the government to court over its nuclear deal, and energy is a highly contested vested interest because of this history of the extractives and the way that business has been done in South Africa. We took the government to court with the other NGO, in, and in 2017, there was a landmark case decision, which was that it, that nuclear deal was declared illegal and unconstitutional. We did have a number of cyber attacks at that time, but by comparison, the head of the other NGO, Makoma Lekalakala, a black woman from Johannesburg, she had daily threats against her, and I experienced nothing. So I, I want you to think about that and think about where even my privilege as a white woman in South Africa gave me some immunity to some of the attacks that Makoma was facing and the need to really be in solidarity with others who are more vulnerable. One of our team at that time, a youth activist, also ha experienced violence where she was living um, because of her exposure in the media. So we need to think very carefully about who we put on the front line and how we engage. And so sometimes um, it may be easier to have someone like me 
uh, standing up and speaking truth to power than others. And that's not to say that I want to replace their voices or stand on their stead, but it's also just the reality of sometimes what we face in South Africa. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Do you want to fill in? <laughs> no, but that's certainly true. You know, um, activists from poorer communities would be much more targeted. Um, I can just give an example, and that, that, that is reflecting for us journalists. So when we have been doing environmental stories, I remember once uh, we were filming an open shaft coal mine uh, from the highway. You know, that's public road. We are allowed to film. But it took two minutes, and the mining security came and said, you're not allowed to film. You're not allowed to direct your cameras in this direction. I said, we are, because, you know, we, this is a public road. And it came to confrontation, but of course it was never dangerous for us um, to do this. We got our pictures so we could tell the story about what's going on on this road of coal just leaving South Africa 24-7 with all different kinds of, of uh, consequences. I mean, consequences for, for the local population, what kind of dust and environmental issue that it's created just living there. And I remember when we did that story, there was a a woman, um, a, a white woman, actually, in a community who had complained because, you know, there was always coal dust. She was not particularly poor. She was, uh, you know, and she complained. But she said to us that I should never have done that. I have been targeted ever since. Not in a bad way, but just made to know that we keep an eye on you. You just keep quiet. Mm. Francesca, you said that the faith, being um, working for and being part of the, the faith community sometimes can open, open doors. I know that you are part of um, the Presidential Climate Change Committee. Is that the term? Uh, can you describe what, what, what is the government doing? What's the plan? Uh, and what's this committee and your role in it? Thanks so much. Um, Yes, just before I came here, um, I, I don't have a formal role, uh, just by the way. <laughs> I'm not one of the commissioners, but I, I was fortunate to co-facilitate just literally this morning. Um, the Presidential Climate Commission is brought together by President Ramaphosa, and it's looking at how can we do a just transition. And in particular, it's looking at the just energy transition. And currently, there's a consultation process going on about the JET-P. Some of you may have heard about that, the Just Energy Transition Partnership. Now I'm going to go a little bit into a bit more policy things. Um, it was announced at COP26 last year in Glasgow, the first in the world, and it's funding coming from northern governments to support South Africa's just energy transition. Because as you've been hearing, we have, we're a particularly tricky um, country in that we are such a big emitter but we also don't have the resources to transition um, justly. And in fact, we know that many other countries haven't done a just coal transition either. I mean, there isn't a very good track record globally for that. So we do need help. It's 8.5 billion US dollars, which sounds like a lot, but it really isn't. Um, it's, it's just getting us started. So the Presidential Climate Commission was convening faith communities this morning and I was asked to co-facilitate that. So a number of faith representatives who've been following the climate issue came and gave submissions um, to the uh, Presidential Climate Commission. So that is what's happening there. It's a very interesting, I feel oftentimes that like we're at, at the first step in addressing climate change. That when we talk about climate justice, that's something very aspirational still. There's so much that needs to be done and I want to say that Church of Sweden and Sweden has been a tremendously important partner for my organization. There really is solidarity um, in the support that we have, in the, the, the partnerships that we have. Also, um, uh, Swedish, I don't know how to say it in Swedish. <laughs> Swedish Society for Nature Conservation is one of our other partners. And really, it really is this that allows us to do this important work and also gives us some measure of protection, I believe, in doing the work that we do. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, thank you.
and, and Marika, continue to talk a little bit more about the, the politics and the, the situation. Uh, can you see that, that Sweden can push South Africa? Is that relationship still strong, that the, what, what's, what's happening in Sweden also mm. can spill over? Well, I mean, first of all, we have to just basically be completely aware of that climate change don't have any national borders, don't give a damn about politicians or, uh, you know, anything. You know, it is completely a global problem. And I think until our uh, decision makers start to talk about these issues in that way and act in that way, we have a serious problem. Um, you know, I mean, I think, yes, of course, Sweden can help, but there is a lost opportunity. We should have been a good friend to South Africa from day one. Our aid stopped 1994, and that was a big mistake. It stopped to support culture, workers, activists, and all sorts of things that would have been so much stronger in acting as civil society and putting pressure on um, decision makers, whether they are ANC or whatever. So I think lost opportunity. So where do we start now? I'm, I don't have that answer, but I think, yes, we're going to have to work together. And we need to learn from each other. Um, I am actually, I remember when I stopped working as a correspondent uh, for Swedish television and I said to to my editor, I said, this is really the time where we should have a correspondent in South Africa and report daily because all of a sudden, you know, for a few years back, we were exporting weapons to South Africa. It was an enormous uh, cost to the South African society. So were we friends when we started to export weapons? And I think, from my opinion, lost opportunity and we need to now connect with those who are willing to do the hard work of putting pressure on decision makers and therefore I would daily also see support good journalism <laughs> because that is a key to keep up because journalism in South Africa has been the key to expose all the corruption that has now made people aware and, and craving for some kind of, of change in good governance. Mm. Support to, to journalists, support to faith communities. If we go back to, to the movement uh, in South Africa, movement for climate change, climate justice, is it strong? Can you describe it? Yeah, I mean, it's... Uh, yeah, I think that... What I'm seeing in the climate justice movement in South Africa, similar to here, is that the youth really know where it's at. And uh, they are really the ones who push us hard um, to think about our assumptions and our presumptions and to do more. Um, I think they have the urgency that some of us who've been doing this work we still have the urgency, but maybe we get a little bit more cynical or see barriers where the youth don't see them. And so I think that's a tremendous, there is a very vibrant and active um, engagement in climate justice in South Africa. I would say civil society is, is strongly engaged and I just see it growing more and more. I mean, just last week, civil society met with the trade unions to talk about the just transition. These are groundbreaking conversations um, and they're very important but I still do feel like we're just kind of saying hello to each other there's so much more we need to be doing uh, and and this and I, I do believe and we were having this conversation earlier that the crises push us uh, to take further action so as much as we don't want to get into climate crisis that is the way that it happens and there is a social response to that um, which I think is appropriate and will bring about change. What we want to see, of course, is lasting change. So that's where these government mechanisms are so important. Yeah, uh, I mean, communities in South Africa over the last few years lived without water. You know, dams have been emptied. Uh, the harvest is, is burning to pieces because it's too hot. 
uh, food security is a dire issue, water is a dire issue, and it's not just in South Africa. So, um, you know, I am, uh, I, I think, you know, the, the, there should be so much more done, uh, and so much more should be put, support should, could be going in, and that's, I fully agree, the youth is the hope, but uh, if you don't have electricity because there's load shedding, and you don't have food on the table because, you know, there is basically no jobs, it is an issue. And we also have an ANC conference coming up, and there could be a change in the whole leadership. And, you know, so there are many in, insecurities in who will you deal with. And policy has always been good from the ANC, but the implementation have failed over the last 25 years, if we are realistic about a lot of things that's going on in South Africa. So I think... Um, if, if, we really, if we are really serious, then we should really put in a hell of a lot of work and a lot more funding as, 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 uh, you know, from, from Sweden or from the church. That, that's just my personal opinion, because I think it is very much, it's a hurry. We, we are dealing with something that is, can tip over quite easily. Yeah. Mm. Working with South Africa, living in Sweden, is South Africa, as you describe it, so extreme. Everything is much more in either way. Uh, and we are facing higher prices on electricity. It's a division between uh, the city and the countryside sometimes. And it's even everything is, is bigger and more extreme in, in South Africa. How can the climate change movement and environment movement be the link uh, and not divide people because sometimes we need higher prices but uh, that affects people living in poverty. Yeah, unfortunately politicians everywhere use uh, crises to their own uh, political aims so sometimes we see things happening that we don't want to see um, and uh, I think that for us, it's really about continuing to make linkages um, with different faith communities. Um, for us at SAFSI, that's absolutely critical and that's the, the vehicle that we always will use. And we do try and collaborate with others. So we don't, it's very, very important, I think, when you're dealing with such a complex energy system and complex crisis. And we haven't even gone into the issue of load shedding where many people have more than six hours of no electricity every day at the moment. Um, there were a number of people that weren't able to attend that consultation that I was in earlier because they just don't have the power and it affects our cellular systems. And it really is dire. Um, yeah, I, so in, in terms of how do we link and how do we move forward, I think it's working across civil society. That's very, very important. And working to, as we've heard, uh, the media, they play a critical role, the churches, um, and also other civil society entities. So that's how we work. Um, you know, the ANC has been in power for a long time, um, but for us, no matter who steps into the leadership shoes or who remains in leadership, we need to continue to um, really push them for change and to analyze and critique what decisions excuse me, are being made on behalf of the people living in South Africa. Uh, we see rising xenophobia. You also see it in Euro Europe. Many of those issues that you're facing here are similar in South Africa. So the closing of borders, um, these are crises. And the instability, as we've been saying, in South Africa really will um, impact all of us, just as climate change impacts all of us. This instability and the rising conflict that we see relating to that um, in the rest of Africa is happening, affecting South Africa, and of course it will also affect Europe. So yeah, in that we are all together, absolutely. Yeah, yeah well, I think we can also remember the way Desmond Tutu worked in, in he was highlighting climate um, awareness uh, long before many other world leaders were talking about it. 
of course, is not with us any longer, but there are things one could learn from the way he did it and, and continue that work as well. So there is a, there is a map there which one also can, can use, I think. Um, and and I, I, you know, as we've just been saying, we are all in it. Nobody, everybody's going to be affected. We are already affected. And, and unfortunately, in Africa at large, the effects of climate change have been there for much longer than we maybe have recognized. Conflicts in Darfur stems partly out of conflict, uh, uh, climate change, you know. Uh, people didn't want to realize that in the beginning. Uh, issues around uh, communities in, in Kenya, um, there are so many things that are affected and we can't, people can't rely on rains anymore. So, you know, we, and then we say, oh, well, but, but once again, then Africa is not the biggest admitters. They, they admit hardly anything. That's but they are mostly affected yes. people in Africa. And we call this seminar climate justice in South Africa. Mm. So why is it important that, to talk about climate justice? Well, there's a debt that's owed. There's a debt that's owed to Sub-Saharan Africa. Sub-Saharan Africa is the least of the emitters along with other southern, southern nation states, and yet we will be most impacted. And I know that there's uh, Father James in the audience who's representing uh, the Pacific Islands. And if you understand the existential crisis of climate change, that's being experienced by people living in these parts of the world, then you realize the debt needs to be paid. And how do we pay that debt? How can that happen? And I think it's a conversation that should be happening in Sweden. It's a conversation that needs to be happening in Europe. What is it that we can do to really be in solidarity with each other? So that people who aren't sitting on, privileged to sit on the stage like I am, who are suffering right now, from lack of drinking water, from lack of energy. How is it that we can really support them? I think as people of faith, there is a moral imperative to think of others, to really try and reach hands out across and support each other effectively. And I think this is the question. And I really like to end with a question because I, I think asking ourselves the right questions is more important than the answer. The answer may change, and the answer will change as the crises come, as we face climate change together. We live in an uncertain world, but we need to ask ourselves the question, how is it that we can be truly in solidarity with each other? What does addressing a historic injustice look like, and how can we do that? Thank you. Thank you. We, we do have a few more minutes and people are coming, maybe for the next seminar, but we are here, so we take the opportunity uh, maybe to, to, to again describe South Africa. So, but for, for you, Marika, what, um, if you would dream, what will be the next documentary linking these issues? What will be the theme and how could you... What well, I, I think, you know, we, we have highlighted many of the problems um, and, and that is okay. We, sh we must look at the reality to be able to find solutions. But of course, there are solutions there. There are many very good examples of how it is possible to support communities uh, in many ways. And people are already doing that uh, and have done for a long time. I, I, uh, there are many good examples, and I think that would be something I would like to look at. But not in a naive way, but actually seeing what is making real changes. And when people and decision makers take decisions together and they are long-term sustainable decisions, uh, I think that would be fantastic as an example of all the good work that is done. Um, but, you know, I am, I'm a journalist at the end and I, we need to look at the problems. We need to look, understand why. And of course, all of us can change our consumption. That is the first start of trying to be solidaric. Uh, how do we uh, not plunder this earth further? <laughs> and Francesca, do you, where, where do you find hope? and maybe also to describe some of the results that you as an organization has 
seen? Yeah, I think for us, educating ourselves, educating myself, educating each other, having conversations about what is climate justice, why is this important to us, um, really going on that path together to think about what can I do? Of course, I flew here in an airplane, so that there goes my carbon footprint for the year. Um, but there's other things I can do in terms of consuming less meat. I mean, we know these things, but it's about really asking yourself on a daily basis, what can I do today to make a difference? And sometimes that is supporting others. Uh, sometimes it is um, doing analysis of policies, really having a close look. So what is our government busy doing um, around energy systems? How is that going to impact me and also others? Um, you know, there are things that we call false solutions to climate change and false savings. You know, false economy is something where it looks like you're getting something really cheap, but you can't see the true cost of the meat that you've just bought to the Amazon forest. Or you can't see the true cost of choosing this energy supplier over that one. These are the kinds of choices that each of us have, and these are the kinds of things that we can pressure our governments on. What is it that they're doing in terms of our needs and how will that benefit us and others in the longer term. So these are some of the, the conversations that SAFSI has in South Africa with uh, faith communities that we're working with. And we really encourage people not to feel that you have to become a climate expert or that you have to suddenly understand all the analysis. That's what we do in civil society. But members of the public can also stand up and say this isn't good enough. You don't have to be a climate expert to stand up and say this isn't good enough. And you don't need to have all the science. I mean, sometimes people want to debate things, and that's fine. But actually, even if it's just from a moral standpoint, this is wrong, and I'm able to stand up and say that, that's something that we really want to encourage people to do, to use your own voice, use your own agency, because each of us really can make a difference. I, I firmly believe that. Thank you. And Marika, finally, to you, where, where do you find hope working in this environment? Hmm. Well, um, first of all, I don't think we can do any kind of work if we become pessimistic. And if we feel shameful and, and uh, constantly have that negative, a negative feeling about what we are doing and how we are living, you know, rather try to approach this with some kind of positive attitude and realize that we can make a difference. That's what I'm trying to do, and I try to live in a slowly changing my way of living. But I also like to go to South Africa or other parts of the world because I believe in meeting people. So don't sh be shamed over how you are meeting people, but try to make a difference. Like Desmond Tutu said, try to do good, little bit of good where you are, and all those little bit of goods will slowly come together and make a better world. And I think, you know, just keep up the good work and don't give up. I see a lot of people here, they, they give me hope. <laughs> so, yeah, just Thank continue you. the good work. Mm. Thank you so much. We are coming to an end. Uh, we bring with us Desmond Tutu's word, uh, the role of the faith, faith community, the role of journalism uh, in the fight towards a better and more just world. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Ja, men ett jättetack till Akt Svenska kyrkan för det här spännande seminariet. Nu ska vi bara flytta på ett bord här så kommer snart nästa programpunkt. Och man ser ju att det är fullt.